Okay, um, if I start trying to talk about what Larry meant to me, I'm not going to hold this together. So um, I'm just going to try and get through this. My talk is Sandler's Molecules, and it's because if you had to boil my career down to a couple of words, it's that Larry found all these mutants, and he created this way of dissecting meiosis. If you look at that paper, it's really the first attempt in a metazoan to attack an important biological process by a forward genetic unbiased screen for mutants. And what I've built my career on is analyzing those mutants and giving them molecular biology and a cell biology. And that's an inheritance I don't know how to be fully appreciative of. We thank Larry. We thank Larry a lot. But it was a village, right? It wasn't just Larry. People have talked about Herschel Roman. Herschel was an amazing force on so many of my careers. And you'll hear so many of our careers, and you'll hear about the effect he had on mine in a few minutes. But it was also each other. So I get this opportunity that I may not get publicly again. I had the great courage to be in the lab at the same time. Excuse me, courage, yeah, maybe. Um, the great blessing to be in Larry's lab at the same time as Barry Ganetsky for about a year. I can't tell you how much I learned. Barry was an incredible teacher, and he was there all the time, even after 5 o'clock, right? <laughs> and if you want to ever have a student and says, how do you do genetic analysis? How do you actually really do it? Have them read Barry's thesis. It's an amazing, beautiful piece of work that shows you how you dissect a genetic system in a way that I can't think of anything else that does. So to all of those people, to other students, Adelaide Carpenter and others who came before, and Kent and Bill and so many others who came after, I'm incredibly grateful. But I'm going to start talking about Iris for a minute or two. So when I came into the lab, my thesis was actually not based on Larry's work. It was based on Iris's thesis. And what Iris had done was she was interested in how, say, for example, two X chromosomes might pair during meiosis. And in her thesis, there were a couple of experiments, actually two. One of them involved this translocation involving the X and the 4 between these two regions. What Iris had noticed in her thesis was that this translocation as a heterozygote suppressed exchange from here to here, but had no effect from here to here. She'd even looked at a second translocation, one broken over here, that suppressed exchange from here to here, but everything was fine out there. So in an economy of scientific thinking that impresses me to this day, she used those two translocations along with Larry to come up with this really clever hypothesis. And that was maybe pairing on the X chromosome Drosophila was based on three sites. And they defined two major intervals. And what mattered between those two intervals in order to get good pairing was continuity. Because you imagine if you wanted to pair two ropes, right, the fastest way would be to grab both ends in each hand, pull them apart, and things get taut, right? And so Larry said, okay, what you need to do is we only have two translocations. Could you get some more? By that he meant 30. <laughs> and it was clear that I was going to spend the next four years measuring exchange and translocation heterozygous. And that's what I did. And to a large extent, it worked. I mean, we were able even to get translocations like right here that went out here but didn't cross proximally, right here, went over here, didn't cross distally. It all worked. But it was all based on translocations. And so about in the beginning of my third year, I was over in the library, and I came across this paper by Dovshansky on the meiotic behavior of duplications. And I realized, right, that if Larry and Iris were right, then I should be able to get exactly the same effect, not by introducing a discontinuity, but by putting in a duplication for that site. That a duplication for that site should pair competitively, and as a consequence of pairing competitively, it should suppress exchange from here to here, but not from here to here. And it shouldn't matter how much euchromatin it can, because all that should matter is that it has this particular site. Okay. The experiment worked, but that's not a point of this story. The point is, I went in to tell Larry about this, and he got very excited. 
He was really excited about it. And I told him about it, and we were having fun, and we were talking, and finally I got up to leave, and I said to Larry, you know, the only thing that surprises me about all of this, Larry, is that you didn't think of this first. And he started to mumble. And then there was this look on his face. And I looked at him, and I said, you did think of this first. He goes, yeah, about six months ago. And then he paused, and he said... But you were getting there sooner or later. <laughs> and then he waved to dismiss me from his office. And I was dismissed. Okay, I want you to think about the generosity of that. I've asked myself, if I was sitting in my office and I had a really good idea for one of my students or postdocs projects that I thought could really move it along, could I just tuck it in a drawer and forget about it because they really need to get there on their own? Well, I'll ask you to answer that question for yourselves in the time we live in, but I'll tell you my answer, which is no. You know, it would be the, as fast as I could get out to their desk, we'd be sharing that idea and discussing why they weren't already doing it, right? That's who Larry was. Okay, so that's the good news about this project, and it's kind of a nice story. Here's the bad news, and I'm sorry, Iris. The whole pairing model, it's so wrong. I mean, I don't know how these sites work. I really don't, but I will tell you that translocations do not suppress pairing. First sign of that was Kim McKim's work. We've done it. We've gone all the way up to probes that are sitting right next to the breakpoint. Pairing is fine. The synapnemal complex looks fine. Whatever this is, it isn't pairing. And in fact, you're probably guessing that from what Danny Miller told you this morning. The homologs are paired enough that they can gene convert right next to breakpoints, right? It's not pairing. And when I began to realize that, I began to wonder, well, but Dubshansky said it was in 1934. And Larry told me it was in 19... But it's not, okay? So what is it? Well, the, act the answer actually comes, I think, in part from work done by another one of Larry's students, Adelaide Carpenter, who discovered these things in the meiotic nucleus that everyone thought were dirt at first. And they're rec called recombination nodules. And they come and they sit on those double-strand breaks that are going to become crossovers. Not the things that are going to become conversions. They're the ones that become crossovers. All right? They're little mobile surgical units for DNA and for protein, for being able to execute the events that are really required to build the crossover. And in fact, although there's something like 18 to 20 double-strand breaks, there's approximately six recombination nodules, and their number and distribution corresponds to sites of exchange. This is a diagram of a recombination nodule. It's an artist concept. And the reason we say this is that we identified a protein, a protein that's a class of proteins worked on primarily by um, Abby Dernberg and others, which are E3 ligase proteins, so-called ring proteins. And we've shown that this protein and two of its friends Nenya and Narya. And if you're wondering where they got those names, then you're not enough of a science fiction geek and you need to go back and reread your Tolkien. These are the ring proteins, the rings of the, uh, I'm not going to boast. Okay, these proteins form the recombination nodule in Drosophila. The interesting thing about it is, how do they do that, right? So initially, in early meiotic prophase, proteins like Vilia, right? are all along the length of the synaphthemal complex. And then as double-strand breaks are made, it disappears from along the arm, and it aggregates at one or two sites to form the recombination nodule. Okay. So I'm just going to give you a model. It was a model that was suggested to me during my um, the, set, the talk I gave for my review at the Institute last week. Nothing focuses the mind like the knowledge that one is to be hanged in a fortnight. Samuel Johnson. And my mind was ready for it. And the idea is, what if at one site, Vilya aggregates, and as it aggregates, it sucks up, once the DSB is formed, all of the Vilya along the chromosome arm to form this aggregate. And that's really what it looks like to us. How do translocation suppress exchange without affecting pairing? 
They create the discontinuity. You can't get Vilya to move along. Gene conversion will be fine. It'll be crossovers that won't work. Why in heaven's name is Scott talking about an experiment based on a hypothesis that's really four or five days old? Because as Larry told me a long time ago, my career would not have changed if DNA had never been discovered, much less its sequence elucidated. They're just very long pieces of very, very thin rope. And that's how I feel right now. This hypothesis is too young, too pretty, to use a phrase before, too true to be good, right? Um, and I really love it. And I think it's the kind of um, enthusiasm that I learned from Larry, okay? But that's not what I came to talk about. What I came to talk about was something I really would have loved, that Larry would have loved, I think, and that is, we used to have to learn about the chromosomes of all kinds of systems. When I came into the lab, Avril, the technician, who's been discussed before, Avril, the technician, with a can of ether in one hand and her slit cigarette in the other, why are any of us still alive, right? I don't understand, plus the fact we all smelled bad from all that ether in the air, said, Larry cares more that you get A's in other people's courses than you do in his own course. That's actually not true. Larry wants you to get A's in everything, especially his own course. But we had to take this course from Herschel on cytogenetics. And it was all about B chromosomes. And I remember one day in the lab, someone saying, I don't know why we have to do this. Flies don't have B chromosomes. Um, Larry was not happy. Okay, he didn't like that. He felt that there was plenty of reason to have to work on B chromosomes. So what the heck are B chromosomes? Well, there are these except in corn, these little tiny supernumerary chromosomes, they're found in many organisms. We normally think about them in what I call the Nabisco organisms, corn and rye and wheat, et cetera, but they're present everywhere. And they're little tiny dabs of heterochromatin, right? They usually don't carry functional genes. We don't have any idea why they're there. Well, maybe Harmit can explain why they're there. They're sort of genetic parasites that seem to just be around. But as I said, they're not present in flies, okay? They're present in a lot of other organisms, all right? They're even present in humans. And sometimes when we find B chromosomes, they're called supernumerary chromosomes in humans, it's associated with male infertility. All right, but they're not present in Melanogaster, which as Larry would tell you was the only Drosophila. Larry didn't really recognize simulans or any of the others. It was only Melanogaster that mattered to him. And then one day, we're working on a stock that carries a meiotic mutant called matrimony, right, which encodes an inhibitor of polokinase. And we find these, this is chromosome four, this is chromosome four, what the heck are these? We hadn't seen them before, we didn't know why they were there. There were a lot of them. First, I wanted to call up Bill Sullivan because I blame Bill for Wolbachia because he studies it, right? But no, these things were way too big. And they kind of look like chromosomes. And then one of the technicians in the lab actually went ahead and started looking and it turns out that these things, okay, have centromeres, they have telomeres, they're little tiny chromosomes. They're present in this stock. And they're present in 12, 14, 16 copies in the stock. Okay, I want you to think about this. Flies normally have eight chromosomes. That's eight centromeres in, my, in mitosis, right? These guys can have 24. We have wasted so much time measuring mitoses in this stock, looking for some kind of defect in mitosis associated with tripling the number of centromeres. Yeah doesn't matter. I think you could probably give them twice that many. They seem to do just fine, right? There's lots of them. What's kind of interesting is their structure. We've gone after their structure in a couple of ways. One of which was that Stacy Hamlin, the postdoc in the lab, actually physically isolated them. You can actually physically isolate these things. And together with Danny Miller, who you heard this morning, they spent a lot of time sequencing them. But this is one of these times when the calendar just didn't work. It was when Danny had just entered the lab and they were still doing Illumina sequencing. 
one of these days, Danny has to come back with his little nanopores because I really want it tip to tip. But we'll get there, right? So we have the sequence. And what it's told us, right, is that these things really are purely heterochromatic. They have centromeres, they have telomeres. And the interesting thing is they're comprised primarily of satellite repeats that are present on the fourth chromosome, especially on the short arm of chromosome four. Well, okay, look at these guys. We're labeling here for AAGAT, and they really do look. They look like they're just an isochromosome that consists of two copies of the short arm of chromosome four. I mean, look, four is small enough, but this is the short arm. This is the one that doesn't have any genes. Why in heaven's name would you care about it at all? And where did it come from? Well, see, I took that course from Herschel, and he talked about this phenomena called centromere misdivision. I don't know if any of you remember those lectures, right? But this is a plant geneticist thing, right? And they talk about it all the time. They say, look, in plants, you can have cases where if a chromosome is univalent, it has no partner, right? Instead of the centromere dividing the way it's supposed to at mitosis, that instead of it doing that, it actually breaks on both of the two sister centromeres. And that following that, what it does is basically form an isochromosome. Okay. All I knew, all I remembered was that it was a graduate student in the lab who tried finding isochromes in Dros chromosomes in Drosophila using the short arm of chromosome four. And he counted over 5,000 flies. The first one had the genetic properties expected of this thing. It was dead the next morning. The rest of that 5,000, nothing. And Larry and that student decided to give up. Okay, but the more we looked at this thing, all right, the more that we actually studied its structure, the more we realized that the easiest way to explain the origin of this chromosome was centromere misdivision to generate an isochromosome for the short arm of chromosome four. What makes me believe this model might be right, this particular chromosome we have found usually present, as I said, 14, 16, sometimes even 18 copies in an individual. But we've got another one. We call it B2, because they're really clever at naming things, right? It looks like it's just the short arm of four alone. It's not an isochromosome. We're having the biggest pain in the world keeping it in stock because it really wants to be present at low copy numbers. We don't have markers, et cetera. But I'm really beginning to think that that's what happens when you just break and you don't come around and create a stable chromosome with a center. And again, you know, why am I talking to you about this? This is all new. Because I think Larry would have liked this. I think Larry would have liked these kinds of ideas. They would have fit on a whiteboard. Right? And there's one more thing that Larry would have liked. And that is, we keep trying to understand how you get this copy number. And there's a really easy experiment that you can do. You can do outcrosses, take it down to four or six. You can back cross to recreate the original stock, and you can watch the number come up. 12, 16, 18. We've done that a lot of times. Okay? This thing accumulates in that stock accumulates very well. And we have evidence within single generations that this thing is capable of meiotic drive in the female germline. Okay. It's not very strong per generation, but if you work it out, it looks like it really could explain what we see. So how could that happen? How could this actually work? You know, how could the bees proliferate so quickly Okay. When we look at a wild type cell, a wild type fly that just has, you know, bees, but not the original stock. It doesn't carry the matrimony mutant. We don't know how matrimony causes this. 
if we look at where they are at the first meiotic metaphase, we primarily see the spindles in this case are oriented from 9, 9, PM, 9 here over to 3 over here. So it's like this. And they really, everything looks fine. 90% of the time. I mean, every occasionally we'll see something, they're kind of disordered, they're not properly symmetrical. But when we look in a stock in which we see drive, the primary thing we see is that now all of the B chromosomes are in a single mass and they're off to the side and they're obviously playing by different rules. I think, I think Larry would have loved that. I think Larry would have found that observation and found trying to work that out incredibly exciting. Because I do. And I think if you listen to the people from Larry's lab who've talked today, there's something really interesting. You know, a lot of us have reached that age when we're supposed to be talking about buying a boat and moving to someplace called the lake. I've been living in Kansas City for 19 years. I have no idea where the lake is. <laughs> or what it is, but everyone seems to want to go there. But if you listen to the people here talking about science, what you hear is they love it just as much as they did when they started working in lab, in Larry's lab. That's what Larry did. He imbued us with a love of doing genetics. He imbued us with a love of discovery. And he imbued us with a family of friends and people that have continued to care about us. And when it works, it enables us to try and pass that forward, which is the only way in the world we have to say thank you. So thank you very much.